Good morning. Good to see everybody. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. It's, uh, I don't know what this thing is that I have. I can tell you that this is the, this is, I'm, I'm on the tail end of it now. Um, but this has been, hands down, I can't remember the last time I've felt this bad. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I, and I, I've usually, I can push through anything, but this was like, uh, this thing kept me uh, bedridden for a couple of days. And so, as sickness usually does, it makes me very emotional. So if I get emotional, forgive me. <laughs> I do what? I get emotional, I do. I know, I know. Open up to Luke chapter 5, please. And we'll start in verse 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the, fi the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the, from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he'd stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. <clears throat> but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the fellowship, Lord. I thank you for church. I thank you, Lord, that um, you bring us here to hear from you, to fellowship with each other, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the common thread that binds us all. Lord, and that uh, because of you, Lord, we get to know each other and we get to know you, we have everlasting, eternal life, and that life starts here now, Lord, and you speak to us from heaven. I just pray that you do that this morning. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. Amen. So I have to tell you, this was um, one of my more favorite studies that I've done in, in quite some time. Um, this particular study is very, Peter, if you guys don't know, Peter and I, I kind of go off on, on little, on um, kind of character narratives about certain guys and Peter is one of my favorite guys to do a character study on if you guys ever get a, an opportunity to do a really good in-depth character study on Peter the Apostle he's um, very human and um, very he, I think a lot of us can relate to Peter in a lot of ways he's very very human he makes a lot of mistakes I mean there's none of the other apostles were ever called Satan by God except for Peter but yet he was used in a very powerful way um, as the leader of the disciples, Peter was one of the guys that um, you really never had to worry about what Peter was thinking. He usually just told you what he was thinking. He was you know, often the guy who suffered from foot and mouth disease. Um, he really had a problem with just saying what was on his mind all the time. And really, as a result of that, though, he also had a very close relationship to Jesus because he was a... <clears throat> He was um, somebody who wasn't afraid to get in deep, you know, somebody who wasn't afraid to ask some of the harder questions, um, certainly somebody who wasn't afraid to come up close to Jesus and ask, ask Christ certain things. And he was the one that was usually delegated by, by the disciples to go to Christ and ask him this and ask him that. And he was kind of the uh, unspoken, as I said before, the unspoken leader of the disciples. This particular, <clears throat> excuse me, this particular time, though, um, this was not... Um, this was about a year after his first interaction with Jesus, okay? This particular time was about a year after 
Um, his, after his brother Andrew, in John 1, John, the apostle, and Andrew were followers of John the Baptist, okay? And once Jesus comes on the scene, all of a sudden, now Jesus is, is shown by John the Baptist to be the Lamb of God. He says, behold, the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. And <clears throat> John and Andrew go and start following Jesus Christ. After that, Andrew goes and tells his brother that they found the Messiah. And Peter is one of the first guys brought to Jesus by somebody else. He was one of the first person to be evangelized. And um, Peter goes and sits down with Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, You are Simon. He says, You are Simon, son of Jonah. He says, But your name is no longer going to be Simon. Your name is going to be Cephas. It's going to be Rock. And it's kind of an interesting relationship that they then have. But he doesn't really kind of drop all everything that he has and go and follow him at that point. At that stage of the game, it's kind of like a year where he's still teaching in the Galilean area. And he's still kind of teaching in northern Galilee and going around. But Peter hasn't forsook all yet. All right, he hasn't, dropped, he hasn't dropped everything to go follow Christ at this particular stage. Now he has. After this day, he does do that. But this is also after... Um, he has an interaction with um, Peter's mom, Peter's mother-in-law. She's really sick, and she says, she's really sick, and she needs to be healed. And he goes to Peter's house, or Peter's mother-in-law's house, and heals his mother-in-law. And so Peter knows kind of who Jesus is. He's been following him now for some time, but he hasn't really forsook all and followed him. And I, I'm not really big on titling messages, but if I was going to title this message... Um, I would, I would say that this one is, I would title this In the Master's Hands because um, I think it's fitting. We, as we uh, open up in verse 1, it says, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, the lake of Gennesaret is the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's kind of interesting that Luke calls it a lake. Luke had been on, Luke had been over the Mediterranean Sea. Luke had been traveling around with Paul. Um, Luke is obviously, as we know, the author of this letter, writing to Theophilus. Luke had been around uh, seas and oceans before. Okay, so to somebody who was in the from the Galilean area, the, the Sea of Galilee was a was a really big. Probably could have been, looked like an ocean, but to, <laughs> to Luke, it was just a lake. It was a lake. It was a lake of Gennesaret. So when you see that, it was also called the Sea of Tiberias. And obviously the Sea of Galilee, it's the same thing. So it's the Lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by. Now it says it's standing by the lake, but I, I always wonder if, uh, you know, I, as I'm reading this, there's, Jesus comes by and he sees two boats. And you have to try and understand there's a lot of things here that speak, to, speak of the deity of Christ, even though this particular this particular letter is to show Christ in his humanity, to show Jesus in, in, in his very, he's calls, he refers to himself in this particular letter as the son of man. And this is to show Christ as a human, as a man. And he sees these two boats standing by, and I kind of wonder, you know, there's nothing, let me just say this, nothing happens by chance with Jesus, okay? Nothing, there's nothing that happens um, by way of uh, mistake, or it's not like Jesus has to, you know, kind of make up for uh, somebody else just happening to leave two boats, <laughs> two boats by the lake. All right, Jesus came on the scene and he knew that those two bo two boats would be there. He knew exactly what type of interaction he was going to have with the people that day. He went by there and he saw Peter there. He saw a bunch of other fishermen there washing the nets. They've been toiling all night, and he just happened to come up on. Now, they, one one could look at a look at this particular uh, opportunity and say, well. You know, it just so happened that there happened to be two boats there and a couple of fishermen. You know, very lucky. You know, very lucky that Jesus happened to go stumbling by and see two boats there and a couple of fishermen washing their nets. Nothing is taken by chance with Christ. Nothing. Everything is ordered. Every, there's an order to everything. There's never, ever... Um, Lucky shots or lucky chances with Jesus. All right? as, you, as, you get to, as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, you're going to find that he has orchestrated a lot of things in your life. And you're going you're gonna to look back and you're going to realize how many things really. He's involved in all the intricate little details of your life. He's involved. I look back in my life now and I can't believe how many things that he orchestrated. I can't believe how many times that he, 
really came through in days where I wasn't even living for Christ at all. In days where I wasn't even talking about Jesus, wasn't going to church, wasn't re- certainly wasn't reading the Bible. Days I wasn't even praying, wasn't even talking to God, not even the least little bit. <clears throat> but there were things that he had orchestrated in my life to fulfill his desires and his will for my life. There were things that he was orchestrating in my life, things that he was planning for me that I had no idea he was doing. Jesus, he knew exactly what was going on this day. <clears throat> it says, when he, got, when he saw two boats by the lake, um, he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. So the fishermen are all done, right? They've done their thing, they're all done, and they're washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, <clears throat> which was Simon's. Again, no, no, there's no chance there. Got into Simon's boat and asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, you have to try and understand, there's a, there is the fame of Jesus going out. Now, the, the King James calls it the fame of Christ. Earlier on in, G, in, in, in Luke's letter, it's, it's almost like there's a, there's a rumor, there's a, there's a grumbling, right? There's a, there's a talking, there's a word on the street that there's this, this prophet. And nobody, know, nobody really knows exactly who he is or what the deal is just yet. He's going out and he's making a name. He's going out and he's, he's um, healing the sick. He, right, he, by this time, people have already heard about the, the, the water into wine in Cana. By this time, people have already heard about um, you know, Peter, uh, Peter's mother-in-law being healed from Jesus Christ. By this time, he's going out and he's saying things and he's speaking things to people that is something they've never heard. He's giving people the truth and he's giving people the word of God. And just so, we get, just so we're clear on this, this is God in the flesh delivering his own word. And people are pressing to hear this. this there's an incredible amount of power in hearing the truth. There's an incredible amount of power when somebody starts to give you the truth, regardless of how it really makes you feel. It should give you some sense of um, security when somebody takes aside the way that you're going to feel about what someone's going to say and just gives you the truth in love. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was setting aside everything. He'd emptied himself. He was sent to do this very thing, to preach the word of God to a lost and dying people. He came into his own. The Bible says that he came into his own and his own received him not. But there were some, there were some that were pressing to hear what he had to say. He was blowing their minds. The things that Jesus was saying was blowing people's minds. The things that were, the things that he was, like the, the words, literally the word, in fact, John 6 tells us that his words are spirit and his words breathe life. And that's what they were doing. They were breeding life into these people that were just starving for something. They were starving for something and someone to give them something because their whole entire lives they've been probably been told that they were cursed. That they were cursed by God and they were just outcasts and that they weren't worth anything and they were no good. And that if you were below this certain level, then, then you were definitely going to hell. In fact, there was a saying in the day that only a Pharisee or a Sadducee would make it to heaven. And that's just, now we know that that's absolutely untrue. But because they didn't, because there was a certain amount of people that didn't have a lot of monetary things, they didn't have a lot of material things, they were considered to be cursed by God. But these people, he's going out there and he's breeding He's breathing life into the lives of these people. And now people are pressing on him. You've you got to kind of picture this. You've got to <laughs> picture the, this picture on a beach, okay? People, he's trying to speak, <clears throat> trying to speak to these people who are coming to hear him, and now they're kind of backing him up a little bit. And he's kind of taking it, he's staggering back a little bit, and he's probably got, probably ankle deep in the water, and just says, okay, listen, forget this. Let me, let me, we're going we're gonna to try, we're going to redo, redo this. He says, Peter, go grab your boat. Give me a boat. Come on. So Peter takes his boat. They launch out. He says, okay, just put out a little ways. And it's a natural amphitheater. <clears throat> uh, noise travels along the surface of water very well. So if, if you guys know anything, if you guys have ever seen a beach or a lake, generally, usually, you've got a beach, and the beach is kind of slanted in towards the water, right? So now you've got people that are listening. It's this, this, this natural amphitheater effect where a voice can carry very, very far, and you can hear very, very well, as long as somebody's not too, too far away, but as long as they're a good distance off the beach, now his voice can start to project and start to carry. And look what it says he does. He says, then he got into one of the boats, which Simon Peter, um, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. He taught them the word of God. Now, as we get into verse 4, you have to, we're going to see, and we're going to try and look at some very human aspects 
of Peter. In verse 4 it says, When he had stopped speaking, now when he was all done teaching, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Launch out into the deep. Now you have to try and understand that this was, this was in you know, the, the, the beginning of the day. Anybody who knows anything about fishing, I'm not, a, I'm not an avid fisherman. I used to be. There was one time where I was. Um, there, was a one, there was a one point I was a fisherman and I was a hunter and all that stuff. Um, I haven't had time to do that in, in, in the recent past, but I'd love to do it again. Fishing is awesome, okay? Fishing is great. Fishing is a great way um, to just kind of really focus, you know, just kind of relax. You know, you get out there in the morning, early in the morning when you start, when, you, when you're fishing with a rod, it's really kind of cool. I enjoy it a lot, um, except I don't do it for a living. Fishing when you do it for a living. If you talk to any fishermen, they'll tell you they like doing it, but they're only doing it to make a buck. Okay, <laughs> that's really what they're doing. They're not, these guys are not fishing because they enjoy fishing. They're fishing because that's how you made money in the northern part of Galilee. This is the best way to make money. And we read here that, they, that Simon was actually partners with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. There was this kind of family business and they were partnered with it all night long. And these guys, they grew up knowing how to fish. Okay, you come from the Sea of Galilee, you know a couple of things. You know how to go to little Jewish boy and girl school and you know how to fish. That's it. Those are probably the only two things you know. You go to school, you go to a little Hebrew school, and then you come out, and then you get a job. And in the Sea of Galilee, in northern Galilee, everybody knew how to fish. Peter had probably been fishing. He was the oldest of all the apostles. Peter had probably been fishing since the time he was a kid. All right, probably since the time that he was, who knows, since he was old enough to even drop a net or cast a rod into the, into the lake. He, he knows how to fish. If there's one thing that he knows and he's good at, it's fishing. So look at what he says. He says, launch out into the deep and get your nets. <clears throat> and launch, launch out to the deep and drop your nets down for a catch. And look what he says. He says, master. <laughs> Basically what he's saying here is, he calls him teacher. He calls him master, but teacher. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, your word, I will let down the nets. Basically, what Peter is doing here, if you read this in the proper context, what he's doing is saying, teacher, you teach. Okay, teacher. Okay, rabbi, this is what we're going to do. Okay, kind of a little smarmy, all right, a little, kind of a little, uh, we, would, we would be really familiar with this in this area, certainly a little, maybe a little note of sarcasm. I mean, I mean we're just, we're especially around in this area, in this, in this region of the world, in the Northeast region of the world, sarcasm is mwah. It is, mm, sometimes we can just throw it right out there. It's perfect. It's probably being a little bit sarcastic, okay? You don't, go, you don't go deep fishing in the beginning of the day. You don't go deep fishing in the beginning of the day. Everybody knows that. Even somebody who's not, <laughs> who's not a fisherman knows that you don't go deep fishing in the middle of the day because Fish generally, if they, especially if they're lake fish, they they want to cool off. They want to get out to where it's shady, right? Then when when the nighttime comes, that's when they come out and they start feeding. You don't go deep fishing in the in, in the middle of the day. And I don't know if you guys have ever been on the on. Have you guys ever been on the like a um, been on a very deep lake? Deep lakes are creepy. You can't see the bottom. You know, like you, you look over the boat, you can't see the bottom. You don't know. I used to go deep lake swimming a lot, and it was real always creepy. Always kind of thought something was lurking, you know, down below, just waiting to pounce on you, or, you know, like it was, it was always, you know, you always thought that there was something just lurking around in the mud down below. Deep, deep lakes really creep me out, man. I'm cool with fishing on them, but they really creep me out. He says, launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep black abyss. He says, you're going to you, let your nets down for a catch. <clears throat> Peter goes, okay, teacher. This is what he said. Now, this is, let me just bring it to modern, modern day vernacular. This is something that we would totally say from this part of the world. Yeah, okay, teacher. All right, I'll do that, teacher. I'm the fisherman. You're the teacher. Okay, I'll do that. No problem. Whatever you say, boss. That's what he says. Whatever you say, boss. Okay, no problem. Nevertheless, now look at <clears throat> His attitude was wrong. Peter's attitude was totally wrong. But he was obedient. His attitude was wrong. But he was obedient. He still did it. He still did it. And listen, when you read this, he was toiling all night long. He doesn't want to go back out fishing. He'd been working all night long. 
toiling. The, the Bible says that he was toiling. That literally means that he was working to the point of sweat all night. Casting out the nets, pulling back nothing. Casting out the nets, pulling back nothing. Throwing them out again, pulling back nothing. Not one, not even a, not even a guppy. Nothing. He even showed that anything, that he even did any work. Throwing out the nets, nothing. And by the time they're done, they're washing the nets, they're ready to go home. And you can almost see, listen, this is a very human thing. You can almost see Peter's face. Oh, great, here comes Jesus. Okay, good. No, listen, this is what happens to all of us. We get this way. Oh, here comes Jesus. And then Jesus says, hey, Peter, we need to use one of your boats. We need to launch on. I need to talk to these people. Okay, fine. Gets in his boat, pushes off the shore. Already aggravated about the night that he just had. Didn't catch anything. Already aggravated that he'd just been toiling all night long, hadn't caught in a darn thing. And here he is. Now he's going out and launching out into the deep to go do more of what he had already done and caught nothing, knowing that in the middle of the day, you're not going to catch anything again. Nevertheless, he says, at your word, nevertheless, this is a heart that God can use. Right away, that doesn't mean that your heart is going to be perfect all the time. However, are you willing to submit yourself to the word of God no matter what your attitude is? No matter what your attitude is, are you willing to sit there and say, okay, nevertheless, Lord, at your word, because this is what you've asked me to do. Are you willing to say that? Because Peter was willing to say that. Worked all night long, got nothing. Aggravated, irritated, and this is something that every person in here can relate with. Diligently worked. And we don't know. We don't know what was supposed to, maybe he was, maybe he had to pay the bills that week and he was really looking forward to getting a good catch. Maybe he was behind. Okay, fine, Lord, let's go. Okay, let's go. I'll do this just to prove to you that we're not going to catch anything. Clearly, Peter's still having a problem with knowing who Jesus is. You go, you know, Jesus made the boats that were standing by, Jesus made Peter. Jesus made the fish that they didn't catch all night long. All night long, he was orchestrating this one thing because I believe personally, as you read this story, I believe this whole entire story was so that he could get to Peter. I think it was so that he could get to Peter. There was something that was going on. I think he orchestrated this whole entire thing to get to Peter. Now you would think that <laughs> you would think that, that it would be just, a, a, just a, a, a waste of time to do all of this to get to one guy. But think about the things that he's orchestrated in your life just to get to you. Think about the things that he's moved and the way that he's moved in your life to get to you. To just, <laughs> the, I mean, the amount, of, the amount of people that have passed through your life to try and get you to Jesus. Even, whether they were good relationships or bad. Things and times that you thought were an incredible waste of time. Years that you thought were an incredible waste of time. Years of, of, of doing something one way, your own way, that you thought was just a complete and total waste of time. But yet God can take those years, literally, and give you back the years of the locust ate. He can take those years and those things that you thought was a complete and total waste of time. And he can take those things and use them for his purpose and for his good and for his kingdom. And so that's what he asked Peter to do. He says, I know that you think that this isn't, you know, and, and, and again, I have to know that Peter is still having trouble understanding who, what, who it is that he's standing in front of. This is, the, this is the one who spoke the world into existence, okay? He doesn't really fully understand that yet because if he did really fully understand that, I don't think he probably would have been giving him as hard a time as he did. Spoke the world into existence. The one who literally, and as I said, I don't believe in happenstance. I don't believe in chance. Literally all night long was telling the fish, you're not going in the nets. Telling the fish to back off all night long. Telling the fish that tomorrow I have a, I have a meeting. I've got, I've got an appointment with Peter. Rockhead. The rock. I've got a Peter with this really thick, really really thick, stubborn mule of a fisherman who I love very much. 
Every one of us can probably relate to that to some degree or another. But Simon answered him and said, Master, look at this, in verse 5, Master, we have toiled, we have worked to the degree of sweat all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And look at this. When they had done this, they caught a great... Now, the New King James says a great number of fish. And the net was breaking. Some other versions say a multitude. So, <clears throat> anybody in here who's ever been fishing... Or hunting, it's exciting. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When I was hunting, when I was hunting for turkeys years ago, when I used to go turkey hunting, there was nothing that got my blood boiling than when then I, I I would hear a gobbler off in, off in the distance, and I would hear that thing coming. And I'd be calling him in, calling him in. Then all of a sudden, I'm trying to stay as still as I can, and I got my shotgun in my hand, and I'm just hitting him. All of a sudden, your adrenaline's pumping, everything's pumping. You let down a rod into the ocean, right? I've let down some, I've gone deep sea fishing, and you, you snap something on the end of that rod, you yank that thing, and you're reeling that in. You are reeling in, you're reeling a whale, and it's awesome, and it's huge. And it's, and it's coming up, and you're like, woo, and you're reeling it in, you're reeling it in, and then you throw it up on the boat, and it's this big, but you're taking pictures with it. You know, you're taking pictures with it. And everybody does it. You know, you're holding it up and you, you're like, ah, you know, it's like this big, you know. You got to throw it back because it's a bait fish. When you've gone fishing, <clears throat> all of a sudden they drop in these nets. They drop these gargantuan. Now, these are different nets, okay? These are deep. These are deep lake nets. The nets are attached to the boat, okay? You can't, you can't have a net that's not attached to the boat because if you just drop the net into the lake, <laughs> it goes your way, you're making money. So the nets, you got to keep the net attached to the boat. They take the net, they throw it out, they cast it out there, and then all of a sudden, the lanyard tightens up. Zzz, and all of a sudden, it starts to shake. If you guys have ever seen one fish in the end of a rod, right? One fish in the end of a rod, that rod starts to shake, the end of it starts to bend, all of a sudden the line starts to do this. Now imagine a multitude of fish. Now listen, if you're a fisherman, this day just got really good. This day just got really good. Now all of a sudden there is fish just swarming, like just birds or bees or anything or locusts or whatever, swarming into this net. And all of a sudden the net is beginning to bulge and the ropes begin to break. Now the bow of the boat is probably bending over into the water a little bit because it says here the nets were, they're trying to pull the nets in and the nets are actually starting to break. And the boat is actually leaning over. It's starting to list. And now they're probably doing this. They're hanging on to the back of the boat. The boat's starting to list. They're trying to pull the net in at the same time. And then the, everything's getting crazy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> We didn't expect this. What are you talking about? When they'd done this, they caught a great number of fish. So the nets were literally breaking. And then they, look what they did. They, it says here that they signaled. Now they got hand signals, you know. It says that they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Both of these boats, all of a sudden they go, yo, get over here. The guys get, on, get in the other boat. They're like, you guys have to get out here. Now, now, meanwhile, Peter, at this stage of the game, is probably not even focusing on Jesus at all. All right? He's probably not even focusing on Jesus at all. He's probably not focusing on, on Jesus is on the boat with him. And if I know anything about the Lord, as they signal to their partners to come out and help them, if I know anything about the Lord, <clears throat> he was probably right there helping them pull the fish into the boat. Probably right down there. He was the one that taught them how to be servants. The one who taught them how to serve. The one who taught them how to get their hands dirty and how to, how to reach out and touch people. And he's probably down there. And he's probably not smirking, but he's probably laughing a little bit. Helping them probably pull the fish into the boat. And probably saying, yeah, this is great. Probably having himself a good time. And they whistle to their friends, and their friends come out, and they can't believe what they're, what they're looking at. They can't believe what it is that they're looking at. They can't believe that they're seeing this deep net loaded with fish after they've been toiling themselves all night long. They've been working diligently all night long. Now, I don't know about you, It's kind of interesting. In verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Look at this. <clears throat> this is not the reaction of a fisherman. 
You understand? The reaction of any good fisherman or any good hunter generally when you get something good. You have, have you guys ever seen a hunting photo? You're standing over that thing. <laughs> you are. You're standing over that thing, man. You grab those antlers and you pull, you pull those antlers up for a, you know, or you got a fish. You gotta, you're holding that thing. All of a sudden, Peter, he sees Jesus helping him. Peter's, he's, who knows why he had this reaction. But something about Jesus stepping into his world. Something about Jesus stepping into the world that Peter was a professional in. Walked, stepped right into his world and let him know that he really is the master and the ruler of everything. And who knows why Peter had this reaction. Maybe, he, maybe for the past year, since he had his first interaction with Christ, he'd been toiling. Maybe he had just been not only toiling at working, but toiling in his mind, counting the cost as to whether or not he was going to really follow Jesus full on. Maybe he'd been toiling with his family, toiling in, you know, it says here he was toiling all night working, but he might have been toiling with some other things. He might, Jesus came up to him and called him a year before this, and he hadn't gone with him yet. And he was toiling in his mind about maybe possibly going and, and following Jesus and what this is going to cost him. Maybe, and listen, I, I wouldn't hold it, I wouldn't hold it past the Lord to maybe make things in his life a little bit difficult to try and guide him or to lead him to get him to follow Christ. Maybe kind of making some things, guiding and guiding his path, so to speak. This interaction that Jesus had with, with Peter was something that he had been planning for millenniums. He knew exactly what was going to go on this day. And as he sits down, and Peter is face to face with somebody, who knows, maybe Peter been having money problems. And they were really looking forward to a good catch. And all of a sudden, Jesus just gave him all this fish so he can go off and he could pay the bills and get himself squared away. He stepped right into his world. Stepped right into, right into what it was that Peter thought he was the best at. And listen, I'm just going to say this. And I think everybody kind of knows this, but I'll say it anyway. Jesus is way better than us. Do you understand that? Very simplistic biblical truth. Jesus is better than us. He's smarter than us. He's more powerful than us. And the interesting thing here is that Jesus, <laughs> in verse 9 it says, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. There had never been a time in their lives where they had caught in this much fish. Never. There had never been a time. Do you guys know, <clears throat> this is kind of a, not an odd illustration. Do you guys, maybe you guys don't, or maybe some of you don't not follow uh, wrestling, Olympic wrestling or anything like that. Alexander Karelin, if you guys don't know who that is, back in the 80s and 90s, Alexander Karelin was um, the best wrestler ever. Alexander Karelin was a guy out of the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, and he was a, a misfit of a human, okay? He was, um, everybody watches the heavyweights in wrestling, that's what he was, he was a heavyweight, except he wasn't just your average heavyweight. The heavyweight wrestlers generally, they put on that little onesie thing, right? And they're really kind of, you know, fat and hairy, and they, you know, stick themselves into that little, you know, singlet thing, they call it. Alexander Karelin was 300 pounds, six foot three. He had an arm span of seven feet, and he had about 3% body fat. Anybody who knows anything about health knows that, that that's, that's a freak show. That's six foot three, a span of about, an arm span of about seven feet, and, and, and literally a body mass of, of 3% a body fat of 3%. This guy was literally doing things to men that weighed over 300 pounds, tossing them in the air, flailing them around like they weren't even there. And he was beating everybody. Boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, the United States 
<clears throat> came out with a guy, one guy, Rulon Gardner. If you guys know, if you guys know about anything about wrestling, this guy was on. Um, uh, he was on The Biggest Loser a while ago, and um, this guy was the only guy ever to beat him. There was a rule change in the wrestling world. There was one rule change which caused him to beat him, and um, Alexander Karelin came out with a shoulder injury. At the end of the match, Rulon Gardner wins, wins the gold, beats the unbeatable man because he managed to push him out of the ring and get a point, one point. And the other guy, and Alexander didn't score on him at all. At the end of the match, this, this infamous match, Rulon Gardner takes off his shoes and puts them down in the middle of the mat and walks off. He says, I'm done. All done. I, will, I, have, I have beaten the best, and there will never be another time. There will be ne never another person as good as that to beat, and I'm done, and he retired. He retired on top. This is what happens with Peter and these guys. This is the best catch they've ever, ever, ever had, ever in their life. The best catch of fish. And the reason they got it was because they had an interaction with Jesus. The best catch they've ever pulled in. Any one of these guys will tell you for years, we've never had a catch like this. It's a fish story, no doubt. You should have seen that one time. And they would be telling the story for years. It was this one time, even if they weren't with Peter, this one time, man, we were fishing with Jesus and the boats bending over, nets breaking, water everywhere. And you guys ever talk to somebody who knows how to tell a story? Oh. Oh. The nets, they were like two inches thick and they were breaking everywhere. Talk to a, teen talk to a teenager, they'll tell you a good story. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, look at this, because it's kind of an interesting phrase. Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Maybe that was what he was toiling with. Maybe he was just toiling with forsaking everything that he had to follow Jesus. Giving up a little bit more of his life to follow Christ. And Jesus had to have this interaction with him to let him know that everything was going to be okay. Jesus had to step into his life to show him that he could trust him. He had to step into Peter's life to let him know that he could trust Christ. Trust that he would be his provider. Trust that all he's got to do is listen to the words of Christ. It takes a lot sometimes for this to happen. It doesn't happen overnight. Didn't happen overnight for Peter. It took over a year before he actually forsook all and followed him. But this might have just been the interaction that he needed. It's kind of interesting that he tells him not to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, don't be afraid of what? Don't be afraid of following Christ. Don't be afraid of obeying Jesus. Don't be afraid of listening to his word. Interestingly enough, years later, not too, not too long later, but about a year and a half later after this, Peter becomes that very thing, the, the fisher of men. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people. One day, God saved that's a catch. 3,000 people. Some of the people, some of the same very people that crucified Jesus. Some of the same people that were there literally crying out in the streets, crucify him, crucify him. Some of those people came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Some of the people that were given the option 
To release Jesus or Barabbas? Who do you want to release? Every one of them cried out, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Send out the murderer. We want to set him free. Some of those same people, maybe even one or two of them were the ones that were actually putting the nails through his hands and feet. Maybe those people, maybe some of those same people were the people that were spitting on his face. Whipping out his beard. And on the day of Pentecost, they had an interaction with God. Where God stepped into their lives and they had the same reaction. Depart from me, oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. I can't even believe you would give me this amount of grace. Can't even believe that you would love me this much to send your only son. They had each one of us. And if you haven't yet, you should. Each one of us has had an interaction like this with Christ at one point. Not all the time. When Jesus steps into your life and you just say, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. I can't even believe you waste your time with a fool like me. I can't even believe it. You forgive me over and over and over again. And he used Peter to do that very thing that he was so talented to do, but for the glory of Christ. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. From now on, from henceforth, you're going to catch men. And it says this. It says, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So after that whole entire interaction, that was when Peter drops everything. After he saw Christ turn water into wine, after he saw Christ heal his mother-in-law, after he saw Christ step into his life and give him so much of a multitude, a multitude of fish, he saw that happen. He dropped everything. Peter would struggle. Peter had to still be corrected from time to time. He would say some very stupid things. He would also say some very profound things. But he would go. And his heart was always with Jesus. He would deny him three times after Jesus told him that he would do that. Three times. And interestingly enough, wouldn't you know that Peter always went back to fishing when it was time for him to start backsliding a little bit. He always just went back to fishing. Jesus gets crucified. He gets laid down in the tomb. He's risen again. They don't see him for a little while. Peter goes off and he starts fishing again. That's all right. Well, that was a good run. Let's go back to fishing. And the same thing, toiling all night long, they're fishing all night long. Just went right back to doing what he was doing before. All night long, Peter and his buddies are fishing all night long. And then there's a guy on the beach. Basically says, hey, you caught anything? Nope. Let your nets down on the right side of the boat. And they do that. And the same thing happens. Same thing. 
And Peter, Peter is the only one who knows this. He jumps off the boat, jumps right off the boat. It's the Lord. <laughs> but he uses that to remind him, to get him back, to remembering what it was that he was called to do, what it was that you're called to do, to one degree or another. So the question, really, is what is it that's that's what is it that, that holds us back from just trusting the Lord all the way? Maybe he's maybe he's been working on you in your heart, and you've just been toiling, making yourself really tired. Something in your life that he just wants you to give up. And you've just been toiling, going back and forth with it. And he steps into your life and he just lets you know how much he's in control. All you got to do is trust him. <laughs>